strike up a discussion. This is your day. Well, this might be real fast. Can everybody hear me okay? I hate holding the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, usually people can hear me, especially if I don't want them to. Number one, anybody who believes in conspiracy theories, just remember this. There was no collusion here. I never met this man before in my life. And I gotta tell you, what he's handed you right here is probably the most concise, succinct, valuable thing you will ever get a hold of. Read it, pay attention to it, it's excellent. Um, these are the kind of things you have to you have to do. I told the camera might not be able to pick up your voice. Can can you pick up his voice? The camera. You're okay. okay. <laughs> I didn't I didn't do my I forgot my bronzer. Um, yeah, I didn't do it's, my hair. It's going to be on our website, and it'll be on public TV and things like that. Woo! So if you don't have a mic, Frank, you're capable of speaking up. But if you don't have a mic, please do speak up so that a week from now, when people watch this, they'll be able to hear what you say. I didn't know it was showtime, but um, I, I really, I would have gotten my hair done. Uh, I just want to say this, this is great stuff here. Thank you very much. That's an excellent job. Um, my presentation might be real quick because my netbook doesn't interface with the projector and apparently the projector is searching. So one of the things I do, I do have some URLs of some sites that I think you really need. <clears throat> I'll just email them to Phil and you can make sure everybody who was here get them or put them on your website. We'll put them on our website. Okay. I mean, you're going to need them. One is Blogger Law. Uh, there are a bunch of, of the people in this country really concerned about the risk that us unknowing citizens are taking uh, stepping into this arena. I have to say that I think um, uh, bloggers, emails, and tweets especially are the most fertile ground for uh, repressive libel suits that I've ever seen. Remember, you send a tweet, you have published. Okay, if you, somebody thinks you've defamed them, falsely defamed them in that tweet, which would be easy enough to derive because it's hard, almost impossible to figure out what any of them mean anyway, uh, you could be sued for libel, for a tweet. Okay, most libel suits really stem from lack of context anyway, from lack of telling the whole story. And <clears throat> how do you tell the whole story in 140 characters? All right, so I, it's just me. I haven't read this anyplace else and I haven't seen anything yet, but you, I think, are at higher risk uh, tweeting than doing anything else you did because it would be so easy. It's kind of the, um, the plaintiff's interpretation of whether they were falsely defamed by it or not, and you have to live with that. Uh, the first part of this is about FOI. You have excellent FOI information there. You live in the great, almost greatest state for FOI with your constitutional amendment. You run up against the exact same wall that all of them do. That is, how do you enforce it? Statute or constitutional amendment. If you don't have the power to push it, you don't have the money to push it, how are you going to make it happen? Okay, the only, the best state is Connecticut where they have an FOI commission a quasi-judicial body that any citizen can go before and they will help you present your case and it really works well. I was in it a lot both times that I was there. The only problem with that is when they lose, somebody from government loses in the FOI commission, then they can take it to court. And as I pointed out many times in columns and editorials, when they take it to court, they're still spending the taxpayers' money. So you have to take money out of your pocket to go to court. They took money out of your pocket already for them to take it to court. So FOI laws, basically, I called them when they first, and I, I'm old enough to remember before FOI laws, <clears throat> I started calling them FOI barriers immediately because if you need to file an FOI request, you failed as a journalist already. You should have the information. It's like the old lawyer thing, never ask a question in open court that you don't already know the answer to. If you've had to file an FOI request to find out something, you're not a journalist. You're not. The only thing I ever thought they were good for is to cover for people who had slipped me stuff. How did you get that? Oh, file the FOI request. You file an FOI request, you better already know what you're looking for. You better have had somebody slip it to you. 
Find out what you need to know. Shame on open meetings. They're, uh, meetings are show business anyway. We all know what, where it really happens. Find out the bar or whatever where they, they get, a, get, the, get, a, get their business done and hang out there. Develop your sources. If you're a journalist, you know, FOI is for people who aren't journalists. FOI is for lazy journalists. FOI primarily gave bureaucrats a, a, an initial barrier to any citizen getting information. Used to be you went in and asked for it. Now, oh, you have to file an FOI. They make you file an FOI request for everything. You ask them what time it is. That's what I told one mayor. I said, hey, what time is it? Oh, excuse me, let me file an FOI request for that. You used to just go in and get the records. You used to just show up at the meetings. The FOI laws were passed as the last resort not the first hurdle you had to jump, but as the last resort when you had been refused open public record, when you had been refused admittance to an open public meeting, that's why they passed FOI laws. Immediately upon their being passed, the bureaucrats turned them into, oh, well, you have to file an FOI request for that. No, I really don't. Just give it to me. No, i got to file an FOI request. A classic example was in New Jersey with <coughs> police cases where Governor Christie Whitman, who, except for that pension bond thing, was, I think, a pretty good governor and almost a Republican, but the, um, she issued an executive order to all police departments in the state saying that in no later than 72 hours, if you investigated a crime, if you had a report, if you had something that you logged in, within 72 hours, no later than 72 hours, here's the basic information that you have to tell the people of New Jersey about that. If a crime has been committed or you think a crime has been committed if you've investigated something. Literally, the very first thing that came up when I called a police chief and I told my reporters this was going to happen and they didn't believe me, the police chief said, well, no, I can't really say it. It hadn't been 72 hours yet. <laughs> It's the way their mind works. It's like Kafka or something. I think there's this ingrained gene or something in people who become uh, uh, bureaucrats to, to turn this stuff upside down. And I said, no, sir, it means you can not go longer than 72 hours. It hasn't been 72 hours yet. You file an FOI request immediately. You have, you have triggered a response that if it's, the law says they must within two weeks give you an answer. You ain't going to be getting an answer before two weeks, right? Right? Has anybody had that experience? Or whenever they have to respond, they, they say, well, we, we can't respond before two weeks has gone by. So this is the kind of mindset you're going to run into. And the only thing I want to stress on FOI law, and you've got a great one, is snuggle up to a lawyer. Uh, for the second part of my thing, you'll see uh, a handout about near versus Minnesota. <laughs> And I always said, if Colonel McCormick of the Tribune, who makes our conservatives today look like liberals compared to this guy, if he could snuggle up to the ACLU, so can you. There are many things here where I really believe the left and the right, the Republic, good Republicans and good Democrats, the people who care about America, have a common cause, common goal, and should be working together more than they're working against each other if they, if they got past the rhetoric. Uh, the ACLU has as much interest in open government. Yeah, read, read that. It's in the back of your packet, this uh, near versus Minnesota. Now we're going to get to the part about getting yourself into and keeping yourself out of trouble. Um, that, the, again, libel and defamation um, risk that I think bloggers are taking, they have no clue of the abyss they're walking along the edge of. How many times have you been sued? Yeah, I lost count too. The best thing I, I, that ever happened for me with the um, no cussing allowed, right? Didn't you say that? No cuss away. Oh, chicken shit people run in newspapers anymore. The best thing that ever happened to me is when the trial lawyers got together and said, here's how you'll terrify them. Sue the editor personally. Personally sue the editor as an individual. Okay, I like that. First time I got sued, I said, good, I don't have standing. I don't have to go through some weed publisher and corporate stooges to have subpoena power 
to have deposition power, okay? Somebody does make a mistake as to when you remember, that gives you incredible powers. The way you get the most powers in this country as a journalist is to get arrested. Then suddenly you really can gather information. It's one thing for somebody to withhold a record from you or say no comment, but it's like tell it to the judge. If you're a criminal defend defendant, one of the reasons they decided to drop criminal charges against me in the cases that I had is that I suddenly had subpoena power. I had deposition power. I could bring people in and put them under oath and ask them my questions. But they decided they didn't want that. If you are sued, you will have, within certain limits, powers of deposition, powers of subpoena, search and seizure, okay? I loved it when they started suing me personally. I had what's called standing. As just an employee of the company that was being sued, I had no standing. And uh, as an individual, I did. Now, you got to be ready to pay for it, or you got to be ready to step in and slog it out yourself. Our, our civil and criminal justice processes are not cheap. Uh, one of my arrests uh, cost me personally $20,000. Um, I did generate like 40,000 new unique visitors to my column, so I figured on what it cost to get unique visitors anymore. That worked out pretty well, but uh, it's still a hit, and you better be and you better be ready for it. Uh, the classic uh, case is Near versus Minnesota. Who's ever heard of the Supreme Court case Near versus Minnesota before? There we go. Everybody should have. Before 1931, the Bill of Rights including the First Amendment, because I've never been good at arithmetic, but I think it's the first one, okay, did not apply to state and local governments, all right? <clears throat> if the mayor wanted to shut you down, the mayor could do it. If the mayor wanted to have the police seize all copies of your publication, the mayor could do it, or the governor could. There were a couple of guys named uh, Near and uh, Gilford. I don't know what's in there who were the equivalent of the nastiest blogger you can think of we have now. Think of the nastiest blogger. My kind of cowgirl at her, on her highest course never even came close to these guys. These guys are vile. Vile. Absolutely vile. Yeah, Howard Guilford. Junior and, 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 and Howard Guilford. And uh, the city of uh, Minneapolis uh, just seized all their newspapers and, and they trashed their offices and stuff like that. Uh, and they sued under First Amendment grounds. Got nowhere. Nowhere. All right? I think the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court said First Amendment doesn't apply here. Too bad, boys. Well, the ACLU and Colonel McCormick of the Tribune entered the case. They, the wealth of, of Tribune at that time would be hard for us to comprehend today. I don't think there's anything equivalent. The power was hard for us to comprehend. Pushed it all the way to the Supreme Court, whereby a 5-4 decision, we came within one vote, people, a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court of the United States said, uh, actually, if you're an American citizen, you're protected by the First Amendment from all governments at every level, no matter which particular state you happen to reside in. Uh, Minnesota had a particularly noxious statute about uh, the expression in the public good or whatever. And that, when was 1931? I was very young at the time. Uh, Eighty years ago, 80 years ago is the very first time that the First Amendment protected citizens in the United States from state municipal government repression. Now, you have to be also just to let you know about getting involved. Uh, Guilford decided to run for office later, and um, Let's see, he did not uh, live to gain public office, gangsters in the black sedan forces, car off the road in a close range, and beat a shotgun into his head, which is found to be a fairly effective way to, to uh, prior restraining publication. The fact of the matter is, Thomas Jefferson, 
okay, pr prosecuted criminal seditious libel charges against bloggers and newspapers, including the Hartford Current. It's one of their badges of honor. It shows how far they've fallen. John Adams prosecuted seditious criminal libel cases against pamphleteers, newspapers, broadsides, and individuals. And it tells you that even the people who most understood our founding principle, even the people who um, wrote it, in the case of Jefferson, then when they were in power suddenly, took a whole different perspective on it. If Thomas Jefferson, could, if we could even have a, a, a criminal sedition law in this country, it's staggering. I mean, it was repealed, but that was in our founding time. But if Thomas Jefferson, once he's in power, can decide to use criminal charges to suppress dissent, anybody can do it. How many times have you all known, I've seen plenty of them, the gadfly, the troublemaker who showed up at the school board meetings or the city council meetings, finally get elected, okay, and get on the council and becomes the very worst open meeting violator, hidden record, behind the scenes, enemy of the press that you've ever seen. Once they're in power, it's a whole different story. If you do get in trouble, you have places to turn. I would love to be a blogger in Montana. For one thing, you all have had the wisdom to open your arms and say, hey brothers, you know, we're all in this together. That's what it looks like to me, right? Blogger, blogger can get a break with the Montana Press Association, right? They can get a little help from you guys. There are some states where the traditional media have all looked at bloggers as enemies, as, you know, they make the sign of the cross and sprinkle whatever, and they actually meh, would uh, kind of like to see a, a troublemaking blogger who's been breaking stuff they didn't have go down in flames. Uh, I think you guys are in a state where it can really happen. <clears throat> if you do step on a snake, call this guy. If you get in trouble, you're going to need some help. Has anybody in this room been sued, threatened with suit, threatened with anything from shunning to physical violence? Yeah, one, two, three. Well, Phil got, I mean, they got to threaten you, right? Um, has anybody had anything, you know, any vandalism or anything happen? Anybody been, yeah? Anybody been pulled over by the police? Yeah? I always loved it as a police reporter when they referred to it not as probable cause. Does everybody know what probable cause is? That's where, God bless America, thank you America, in theory, well except in Maryland. Uh, the, the, at some point, the, the authorities, the police, whoever the arresting officer is and the prosecutor, have to go before an independent party, a judge, and say, here's the reasons uh, that we have probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed, and here are our reasons for believing that Frank did it. And they have to give some fair, some specifics. As a reporter, I like getting the probable cause statements because they had to give details that they wouldn't, hadn't put on the police report. And they hated that. Um, the police in Indiana called it portable cause because they could come up with any time. They liked those mag lights because, you know, the broken tail pulled the motors over because of the broken tail light. Well, as they're walking up to talk to the motorists, they just crack the, crack the tail light. If you get in trouble, you've got to learn to stick together. You've got to learn to ask for help. You have an organization here that blessedly is willing to help you. Um, and you have to also, going back to the first session, be sure that the your output, what you published, if it has met the generally accepted standards of American journalism, if you've applied those standards to yourself and to the use of your sources and documents, corroboration, documentation, cross-referencing, if you've always asked your mother when she says she loves you, Mom, i got to go check that out, you will be in a lot better legal shape than if you just libeled falsely defamed somebody as part of some rambling 
blather that you've been doing, or worse yet, some unsubstantiated, unsourced piece of information that you pick up off some other blog and put on yours as fact, okay? If you state it as, as fact, you lose a lot of protections if it turns out to be false. And the New York Times versus Sullivan decision, I, that still prevails. Is anybody familiar with that? Times versus Sullivan? A lot of people don't know it's the big freedom of information, uh, big uh, freedom of the press case. It involved the advertising, for one thing, not news, and the New York Times lost. All right? Those are the two things people forget. But it established a standard that in the public arena, you have to you have to show what's called actual malice, which has nothing to do with whether you like the person or not or are malicious. It has to do whether you knew something was false or showed reckless disregard for whether it was true or false. In the case of Times versus Sullivan, they the Supreme Court said reckless disregard was the fact that somebody in the advertising department could have just gone down one flight of stairs to the newspaper morgue and looked at the news stories in their own publication that would have shown what was stated in the advertisement was false. They said that was reckless disregard. And I kind of think it was too. If the advertising department had used the same standards that the newsroom did, they wouldn't have gotten sued and they wouldn't have lost the case. But the important thing for you is if somebody does successfully sue you for libel, they will have to show that you knew something was false when you presented, printed it, or published it on your blog, or you showed reckless disregard for whether it was true or false. I don't think there have been any cases yet, but I'm positive when one, except for the poor grandma in Texas, but that's kind of a different thing. If you just pick something up, anonymous, just pick it up off another blog and repeat it on yours, that would be reckless disregard for whether it was true or false. Did you make any effort to check it out? Did you do anything to determine whether it was right or wrong, substantial, substantiated or unsubstantiated, right? No, you didn't. So if you applied the basic standards of journalism, before you used it, you would have checked it out. If you couldn't check it out, you wouldn't have used it. I mean, one of the best things you can do is if somebody is, is being defamed, go ask them. Call them, right? Say, hey, John, is that stuff, is that true what they said, that you took your clothes off at the Montana bloggers meeting? <laughs> <laughs> now, that'll probably be in somebody's blog. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, let's head for the meatballs or whatever, but are there any other questions for, for anybody here? This guy's my hero, and I never, I never met you before. Um, I do that. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> and now, is it, um, is it true where the way you state something, like if you say, I know you beat your wife, yes. or you beat your wife, Am I breathing? and saying, uh, in my opinion, you beat your wife. No. Just saying, oh, in my opinion. In my opinion, you haven't stopped beating your wife, by the way. But um, just saying, oh, in my just saying something's opinion in most cases won't get you off the hook. Are you insinuating I'm gay? <laughs> <laughs> Not defamatory, by the way. As I explained to one of my publishers. And he ended up firing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not defamatory to say, to say somebody's gay. <laughs> Even if it's false. It has to be false and defamatory. <laughs> any, any comments about uh, Julian Assange and uh, Bradley Manning as uh, citizen journalists? Well, and I don't keep you. Might as well toss him in the mix. The, the, um, he's almost like a 60s throwback <laughs> from the right. I, I don't know. It just, just shows how it's a whole new world. I don't think that what Assange did was journalism, and I don't think he claimed it was. I think what Assange did is provide feedstock for what journalists do. The journalists don't just pick up his crap and run it like it's fact. I mean, Journalists, uh, 
are the people who go, okay, let's check this out, right? I mean, from, from all of the thousands of pages that he put out, um, I think just a small percentage of it generated actual news stories. And, and they did some, uh, uh, they did a lot of work on it, if I remember correctly, right? New York Times did. Um, I, I think, number one, what Assange is doing, WikiLeaks is inevitable in the, in the age of the web. It's inevitable. It doesn't do us any good to say oh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. You're not going to stop it. I think the, the rulers of uh, China and Egypt and Vietnam and Russia and a lot of other countries are going to find out that the harder they try to put these snakes back in the box, the worse it's going to get for them. I mean, the people are empowered. Uh, I will say, that I just got an email from this mom, a, a young man, a freelancer I know who's missing in Libya uh, for more than a month now. Um, they had credentials from the Kurdish Globe, which is a pretty good paper. Check it out on the web. It's amazing how the press, print's not dying in the rest of the world, by the way. Uh, it's not dying in the rest of the world. It's just print in the rest of the world doesn't have to be 40% net profit margin. Um, I can tell you. But, but um, he, 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 I, the last time I talked to him about a year ago, he'd been through Iran, Afghanistan, uh, Kurdistan, uh, Iraq uh, on, on motorcycle filming and, and reporting. But uh, he had told me that like this need, human need for a free press is, is, is a major powering force in a whole generation of people uh, throughout the world, from, from the Mideast to China to Southeast Asia to uh, Argentina to where it is. Everybody out, we, we just take it for granted. We just kind of go, it's, it's tough talking to people about it as a citizen because all they want to know is who is it, what Lady Gaga is. You know? There's a whole generation of people in the rest of the world who hunger for what we take for granted. And, and, and trying the, for the powers, the authorities, whoever they can pull to try to crush that back down and, and put it <coughs> put it back in the in the vault is going to be very difficult. But so in that sense I support what WikiLeaks does and in the general principle. In that particular instance, I don't think he put anybody's life at risk. I just remember the Pentagon Papers case where, you know, all of our enemies knew stuff about what our government was doing that the American people didn't know. How could it be a threat to our national security to tell the American people but the Soviets and the Chinese and everybody else in the world, right? It could be a threat maybe to our repressive government, but it certainly didn't give any aid and comfort to our enemies. One more, yes, sir. Do you have any comments to make on SNOPs? On SNOPs? SNOPs. Do you have any question to make on, uh, any comments on SNOPs? Yes. Yeah. On the emails, you get these wild emails. Whether it's true or false. Oh, Snoops! Snoops! I know. Where you go check stuff out. Yeah. I, I've found them. I, I go there. I, if there's something really weird I want to check out, and I found it to be fairly reliable. I mean, what, what do you all think of their rigor? I would never use them for my own personal. Well, I would never use them for my professional research. But personally, you know, if I want to know about a cough syrup, Thing, and I get these things where don't ever give your kids cough syrup because they'll die. So I go to Snopes.com and they've debunked it. I would do it for that, but I would never use Snopes as a resource for professional no, I mean, reporting. I mean, if you all want to examine the differences, Snopes.com versus Follow the Money. Follow the Money applies a rigor that is truly, I'd say, I'd, I would use, I use it. I, I would say, one of the said, like for some of our reporters, I'd say I saved my life on a whole ball of You know, I, I, it's just, but the exponential increase in difficulty and cost in doing what they do, as opposed to just lot, you know, blah, 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 um, it, it is astounding, and that's one of the problems in the information that is doing it, follow the money way, it's hard, hard, Hard work, wouldn't you say? 
Uh, Wikipedia makes no pretense at, at anything. It's it's um, it's user driven. Uh, this is you know what you're stepping into. I would never just take something from a, a, a central from Wikipedia and republish it. I, I'm not attributing it to them or to the to the person who made the entry specifically, but but I would be careful about. It. Um, one of the sites I was going to show you is uh, Sunshine Review, uh, which is a wiki type thing. They're very rigorous too. They have a lot of good information. Ballotpedia, uh, Judgepedia, I, I know those people and I think I would use their stuff. Again, not just an omniscient voice, I would attribute it and put a link in. You know, That's one of the great things we can do now, especially on the web. You can use a little bit of something to attribute to them and put a link back and people can go back to that site and um, make up their own mind of whether it's right, right? Which is a big help. By the way, one thing, I don't know if y'all do it, but I, there shouldn't all of y'all like cross-link or do some kind of Montana blogger, um, you know, collective, like somebody was you're talking about with the tweets. Should y'all do all of y'all do that with your blogs and get everybody in on it and say no matter how much we can let these righties, loonies, and we singing people, um, where somebody in this state could go and just kind of get the uh, we have a we have a list on uh, Watchdog. It's not by no means a complete list, but you know it is. It is I mean, just kind of a daily aggregation with their top headline or top entry, right in one spot where you could go. It just, it just came to me while we were going through this. Worth looking into. Yeah. Polymontana.com. Poly Is that it? Is there one? Well, there's one of them. It, it, oh. Yeah, like, like Watchdog, it, it covers a lot of the hot button issues and gets everybody involved in it. Yeah. Um, I guess when we started looking at these uh, open meeting laws primarily, uh, I, I think that there are some other laws that should be um, uh, taken into consideration. The one I mentioned to John was that 712121, which says that the meet notices of meetings have to be published in, in the paper. Well, uh, I think we're looking at the transition going from uh, paper to possibly the, uh, the internet, but the fact of the matter is the law says it'll be published in the paper. It hasn't been amended to change it to being published in the uh, uh, on the internet or a blog. Well, um, it, the Constitution gives you the right. Uh, Article eight and nine gives you the right to know and participate. Uh, so what happens with most of these uh, local government entities is that you don't know that there's going to even be a meeting, or they might put it on an agenda to say it's a working session or some obscure uh, phrase uh, that you really don't know what they're talking about. If it's something where they're going to have a resolution or make a decision, it should be in the paper and the people have the right to know and participate uh, in, the, in the government process. So uh, I, I think that we have uh, to emphasize that more, where we make these people uh, produce the information and publish it so that we can participate. If we don't get that, we get into situations where uh, I said, he said, the commissioner said, and then we get into, in, into these lawsuits that you're talking about there. Uh, they, they come out and say that you libel them. Uh, the fact of the matter is, they don't uh, present the law as it's written. They don't follow the law. They say this is our procedure, and this is what, uh, that we, what we can do and that's what we did, and this is our policy, and if you don't like it, sue us. So uh, we're in a situation there, if, if it's... And then they'll, they'll use your tax money to fight you yeah. in the lawsuit. Right? If, if it's official misconduct, you can get the county attorney to file a crime against them, but the chances of him doing that are slip zip, because he's the one that gave him the legal advice. Yeah. You know, and then if you, uh, if you want to file a suit against them, you can file a civil suit against them, but then uh, the amount, maximum amount of the damages you can get is $1,000. Uh, 
If you lose, you got to pay their legal fees. You don't get legal uh, your legal fees if you do a pro right. se. That's but, the that's the when John was pointing out how they did the flip on the on the plaintiff reimbursement thing by seeking a, declar a declaratory uh, judgment. I mean that, that that shows the kind of ball they play. That's a great example, uh, and, and it's, it's like what you say. It, you know, when you get people in public office of, of uh, bad intent and ill will, uh, you're going to have a problem. And, and unfortunately, <clears throat> you know, there are a lot of really good people, really good ones, decent, honest, caring, committed people, and, and elective and appointed, and uh, uh, even the people who are hired in state local government. I mean, I, I just I've worked with them. I know they are incredible, the majority of them are. I don't know why it's the small percentage of weasels who always seem to end up in control, but, uh, and who scare the hell out of the good people in the government. I mean, I had a state employee in one state tell me one time that you could commit cannibalism during a press conference in, in the governor's office and be suspended with pay pending investigation. <laughs> but if you, they find out you leaked embarrassing information to a reporter, you're done. He said that would, the union, the, the, the politicians, that's the one thing they, they will not stand is, is uh, whistleblower. Mr. Transparency, uh, uh, President Obama has uh, uh, prosecuted more whistleblowers uh, than I think any other administration within the same time period uh, that he's been in office. Uh, Mr. Transparency President uh, got a transparency award and a ceremony at the White House that he closed to the public and the press. It's getting weird, people. Um, I, you know, I think I almost fell for that guy's line of BS. Kind of worries me uh, sometimes. But um, I, the whole point is, you know, I, I think the public notices should be in print because if they don't have to put them in print, look out. You know, they come, they go, they blow with the wind, they can be changed, as somebody said. The, the answer is to have watchdog reporters with professional training prowling the halls of government every day. Every day, every day, every day. And filing every day and finding out what's going on and going to the meetings and going to the hearings and reporting on it. There's no other way to do it. You, you got to have infantry. This is a ground war, people. You have, and, and the newspaper industry and radio and television have been cutting back the infantry for 30 years. You've got to be on the ground. You have to be in there, and, and you better have some skills that they will leave you alive. And I'm hoping bloggers will start filling that void. And, and if, if you file enough stuff that's good enough and interesting enough and, and credible enough, You've proven yourself over time. The papers and the TV stations and the radio stations will start picking you up. They'll do it. Don't you think so, John? You, you, yeah, Phil, you guys have been sitting there with pages to fill or time to uh, fill. And a, a case in point is, is Montana Watchdog. And they first started... This is sending, Yeah. <laughs> and they started sending out the, the stuff to, to Penguins. And they didn't pick it up right away. And, uh, but eventually, uh, they are starting to accept this as, as a suitable news source. Uh, he's uh, been at, at uh, our seminars and that sort of thing. And now, they, they were their stripes for that, and that's what I was at. Well, that, that's my point. <laughs> you, say, you say that we got to go to the homework to do the meetings. Well, it seems to me uh, that the laws are there uh, to limit what the government can do. It's up to them to let us know that there's a meeting going on. How can you attend the meeting if you don't even know it's happening? There's never, when I was a city hall reporter, county reporter, cop reporter, <clears throat> there was never a meeting that I found out about through their public notice provision. I knew a hell of a long time before the note they even typed it up. That was my job. But my that's the law. That's what they're supposed to do, and they don't do it. And why should a different set of laws or whatever their judgment is uh, apply to them 
And if, 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 if we go in and try and dig the information out, they want to sue us for libel. And no, they can't sue you for libel. Well, I, they no. want to make it as miserable for you sure, as they can. Make it as miserable they want to deny you can. the information. Sure. sure. Of course they will. Yeah. Put their spin on it. Yeah. That's what they want to do, and that's what we're supposed to stop them from doing. And it's hard work. It's hard work. It's, it's 10, 15, 16 hours a day on the ground. And, and um, you know, again, I know again, it's not the journalists who wrecked the traditional news industry, people. It's the brass who did that. It's the generals. It's not the troops who did it. Okay? And, and I mean, there are more and more and more, uh, uh, even as they cut newsrooms down, they have people stuck in the newsroom paginating and uploading to the website. And, and doing a whole bunch of tasks that are like processing content, not getting content. And they literally, the lady who was talking about the kid did two stories and wasn't even at the meeting, yeah, I had reporters who had to do that. There was no way we could get to everything. So they just had to call the guy, call the mayor, try to call the officials who were there. And then of course, I mean, I found out about ones where citizens had been at the meeting and raised all kinds of hell. Do you think? Do you think the, the public officials at that meeting are going to tell the reporter that on the phone? No, the best example is one of Dean Singleton's papers, I think it's a Bay Area paper, where he hired a couple of guys in India to just watch the video, official video of the city council meetings and transcribe it, write stories about it. I mean, that is so insane it's beyond comprehension, but the, 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 the you know, what happened was they actually had a knockdown drag out brawl between some city councilmen and some citizens and it was Jerry Springer time. Okay? <laughs> well, click. That didn't get on the official feed that the two guys in Bangalore were watching to write the story. So the paper comes out with a everybody in town is talking about the brawl and chair smashing and uh, literally the police had to come and they arrested some people. The, the, the paper's story the next day on page one makes no mention of that whatsoever. It was that in, in other business, you know, uh, Amendment 327 to the ridiculous. But it's not the journalists who decided not to go to the meetings. It's the brass who decided that. So somebody's got to do it, and I thought this might be a room full of people who we're willing to try to learn how to do it, but I'm telling you, it is hard work. It can be dangerous work, only if you're getting the good stuff. And um, you don't wait around for the public notice to find out that the meetings. Well, I, I think the laws have to change to make it some kind of a consequence to the public. There are the guys who make the laws. Huh? Call them on. I mean, do stories on Well, uh, <coughs> if, if we go in and we do the digging and then you say, no, that's our policy, if you don't like it, sue us. And if, even if you sue them, Quarter. you're talking a year, year and a half. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, and it becomes at that particular <laughs> point in time inconsequential. One of my yeah. newsrooms got me a, uh, after I've been there about six weeks, got me a, uh, one of our hoodie shirts, that, uh, you know, the parka type shirts, and it said, quote the bastards and I mean, it always bothered me. My reporters were kind of into this thing of, I found out when the officials would say something and write it down, and then they'd kind of give them a, a second take, you know, of letting them. They, they call it editing the minutes. Oh, yeah. I, didn't, well, I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Congress <laughs> made it legal. Congress yeah. the national record. They can go put them in jail. I say want. you ought to get out there and put those people in jail. They've been putting me in jail. So where are you all? Well, you look like the criminal type. <laughs> 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 Side. You'd be on the side of the blog. One more than let's head for the meatballs. So kind of by what uh, by listening to between the bloggers and newspapers. So if you have a group or if you have individuals that are out in the public and let's say that they're going to pick City Hall and something comes up to where that person or person wants to get something out to where the general public can know about it, other than just by what's on the blog. This will the newspapers. If they don't take that, if they don't take the bloggers serious, uh, other than say over periods of time mm -hmm. to develop credibility, yeah. how will the bloggers be able to get the truth out? 
Well, that's what I, that's where you got to start sometime. I mean, as far as like with the newspaper, I mean, they have this right. bill. They've done their best. The corporate's done their, its best to destroy it. Yeah. Uh, but you build create credibility in the same way. Follow the money bill credibility. I have not run into a single journalist, politician, or anybody who has questioned follow the money. I mean, it's astounding. And when you were talking about your professors, oh, well, that's within five percent. And then you said, oh, excuse me, guys with the PhDs making the big money studying this stuff. Did you think about the refunds and interest? And then, oh no. I mean, there are the people with the PhDs who didn't get as right as you got, right? You got within one percent. One to two. Oh. One to two. That's pretty good shooting. We like to be precise. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, everybody I've run into, how old are y'all? Um, they started in 1996 in part of the Western States Project. And, and, and kind of bloomed into full, this full national site thing 10 um, years ago? 2000 was the year that we hit all 50 states. Yeah. The election year, 2000. And, 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 and they have a credibility reputation that is, I wish I had. Sterling, a gold standard, diamond standard, whatever you want to call it, right? Unassailable. That's what we say. Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you've been assailed. You get it, you've been assailed. No, I really appreciate it, but well, yeah, they do work hard for that. They, they work hard for it and you build it and it takes time. I, I, there's no, you can't just, I keep telling the, the uh, Franklin people, you know, I'm talking about Wisconsin, you know, it, people in their mind have this kind of like fuzzy place in their brain about what journalism is, is that you just utter the magic word journalism and suddenly you have one. Well, no. That, that you just say, hocus pocus journalisto over something and suddenly it becomes journalism. <laughs> it's not. It, it's hard, detailed work that takes real pros who learned it over. I didn't really think I was a professional journalist until I've been hammered for about five, eight years by my peers. The new kind of newsrooms we started in were brutal. There was not any of this politically correct people's feelings stuff. I mean, it was murder. God, you made a mistake. Hmm. They were on you. Um, and, 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 and that's that's how you become a professional. And, and you don't just, you know, pop the top off of the instant journalism can and and have, have a journalist. It, it is grueling. And, and you have to, you build know, it, it's personal. You put your name on something and people start to trust you. I mean, one of the things I found out is I couldn't, no reporter that I was replacing in a, in a, on a beat, I could not get any of their sources. None of their sources. The sources trusted Dave, but I had to develop their trust in me individually. What I did inherit were all of Dave's enemies. Okay, so well, that's not fair. I didn't have to build in, in uh, hatred. I already got hatred instantly, but I didn't get credibility. One, yes, ma'am. Do you think maybe it's? I mean, I'm just sort of a newbie to all of this, and I don't have a whole lot of experience. But I can see that my problem is probably going to be my reacting rather than acting, because I tend to put. I tend to react to something that's made me mad or whatever, and I can see me potentially putting a blog up there based on that rather well, than... Well, why not you do that? Well, I just... You were talking about being a gentleman and a lady. I'm just admitting that right. as one of my potential flaws, you and that's... I've, I've identified that, so I know well that that's... Did you know that that's program? I mean, some of the <laughs> first time... Um, it was my talk about all the schools play, play, play back and get even. I've seen just the opposite. I've, it's hurt me so many times to give a fair shake to public officials on something who had really played dirty with me, including prosecuting me, you know? And, and yet on a particular issue, if they were doing the right thing, had done the right thing or whatever, I would write the editorial that praised them. And one thing I found by doing that is my credibility went way up. Then I wrote to people in the community who said, did you write that editorial? I said, well, yeah, but, but, but. And I said, well, oh, wait a minute. You know, we hate the sin, not the sinner, right? Yeah. We, we on, on the times that uh, we have opposed, uh, um, you know, the state's attorney, it's been on a specific issue, it was never personal. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, I guess so. 
And, and um, I mean, that's how you build your credibility. And lots of times it hurts. And, and uh, oh, man, you want to just yeah somebody. You know you can, oh, man, they stepped in at this time. One. Yeah. And you go, wait a minute, step back. They may have it coming, they may not have it coming, but you bend over backwards to be fair on those. You know? Um, and, and, you know, they catch the, the state senator who tried to have you killed with, with a sheet and a compromising situation or something. Uh, and, you get, and you have video, use it. But use it discreetly. <laughs> You know, yeah, you have, to, you have to rise above yourself. Just the opposite of journalists doing the petty payback thing. My experience, especially personally, has been just the opposite. In fact, I think I have, and I know others have, who who been who's overcompensated, who maybe cut too much slack on somebody who was known to have threatened them or defamed them. I, I I've been liable. I've been liable lots, and I've never sued anybody because. I just think that goes with the territory. You rise above.